A family grieves over a North St. Louis County mother and her two children and killed in their own home. Around 1030, St. John texted, answer me. The response was busy, I will hit you back shortly. St. John wrote, girl, I was about to beat these streets, but then she realized that wasn't a normal response from Rosie. She wrote, Bobby, let my niece go. There was no response. When I woke up, I heard like screaming and yelling and loud banging. Rosie, the lights flickered. Her porch lights flickered three times. That's when I called, I called her phone twice. She didn't answer. I knew something was wrong. Rosie McCullough posted about her injuries after being released from the hospital. She said, he was able to stomp my chest and abdomen, so the bruising and swelling is really bad there. This was one of the many posts that Roseanne McCulley made on Facebook, talking about horrifying things that her husband had done to her, how he would hurt her physically for hours. He'd done that many times over the course of their relationship, but that last one was the worst one yet, and it was the last straw for Rosie. She took to Facebook to detail what her ex-husband had done to her. A few days later, she and her two children were dead. And that's when they kicked that door open, and her body was laying right there at the front door. By the time I heard everything and they got here, it was too late. It was too late for her and her kids. Rosie McCulley's story takes us to St. Louis, Missouri, a big city nestled along the Mississippi River. St. Louis is a young person's dream. With its iconic gateway arch, a towering stainless steel monument standing at 630 feet, one of its top tourist attractions, St. Louis is also a tourist's dream. The city is home to several world-class museums, including the Missouri History Museum and the St. Louis Art Museum. The city also caters to lovers of sports. Sports fans can catch a game at the Bush Stadium, the home of the St. Louis Cardinals, or the Enterprise Center where the St. Louis Blues play ice hockey. Then there's the mouth-watering food. St. Louis is known for its diverse and delicious cuisine that draws people to St. Louis from all over the world. St. Louis is a city for families. Many families settled there like Rosie's family. 34 years old, Rosie McCulley was described as a hardworking, kind and affectionate woman who was originally from Arkansas, but moved to St. Louis with her family when she was really young. She graduated from the Ladue Horton Watkins High School before going on to study communications at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Rosie loved St. Louis so much, she decided to stay back for school when most teenagers often choose colleges far away from the city they grew up in and their families. But the reverse was the case for Rosie. She wanted to be close to her family during college. After graduating, Rosie decided she didn't want to do anything with her communications degree. She had always been the kind of person who loved creating with her hands. She loved creating unique designs out of a few items and making them her own, so she decided to start her own business, Glitter on 8th Craft Studios. Her business allowed her the freedom to explore her creativity, making custom designs for clients. She also sold craft supplies for people wanting to make their own designs at home. But she didn't just sell the supplies, she also taught people how to make crafts on their own, free of charge. She made easy to follow DIY videos and posted them on social media for people to follow. That was how generous she was. She never hoarded her talent or skills she shared freely with anyone willing to learn. To her family and friends, Rosie was kind, a beautiful, sweet soul who was very smart and funny. She loved to laugh, even in uncomfortable situations. She once described laughter as her way out, saying, no matter how tough things got, she'd always find a reason to laugh through the pain. Rosie was a mom of three to 13-year-old Caden Johnson, six-year-old Kaylee Brooks, and a one-year-old little. For Rosie, being a mom was the best thing she ever did. She loved her kids to death and was committed to raising kind, healthy, well-adjusted kids, regardless of what else could be happening in her personal life. At some point in her life, Rosie met a man named Bobby McCulley III, and they hit it off. They were together a long time, and though it wasn't all roses and sunshine, Rosie stayed with him and even married him in 2018. Before they got married, 
Bobby had put hands on her. It was so bad that she called the cops to file a report about the incident. But after Bobby got to her and begged her, she decided to forgive him and give their relationship another go. After their wedding, Rosie and Bobby welcomed a little girl, bringing the total numbers of their children to eight. Rosie already had two kids before they met, and Bobby had five. In the beginning, they were a beautiful blended family who tried to get to know each other and become a big happy family. But those plans soon fell apart when Bobby, again, put hands on Rosie. It happened so infrequently at first that it didn't feel like something she should worry about, but with time, it got worse and their relationship got very toxic. Things got so bad that Rosie had to cry out on social media. After one very bad incident, Rosie took to Facebook to write about what she had been through. I'm back home from the hospital, everyone. CT showed all my organs are good, but he apparently was able to stomp my chest and abdomen, so the bruising and swelling are really bad there, she wrote. She went on to give more details of her injuries, saying, some muscle damage, they think. I kept saying my pain was like a five, but my BP was 161,115, and they said my BP indicated seven or higher, so they gave me morphine through my IV, and they wouldn't let me leave until it went down. She also wrote that she had a lot of bruising and swelling, and had to be sent home with painkillers to manage the pain. That incident was the last straw for Rosie. She was done with Bobby and initiated a separation. But little did she know, the separation would make things a lot worse for her. After the separation, Rosie went on Facebook to talk about how grateful she was to be rid of Bobby and all the negativity he brought into her life. She wrote, Man, it has been a day, and it's only 3 p.m. Who knows how things will change, but it feels good to remove negative shit from my life. Sistas, how y'all doing? Brothas, y'all all right? Question though, y'all giving the ring back when you divorce them? From the post, it's easy to think Rosie wasn't going through a difficult time because she made light of the situation, but that's just who she was. Even in difficult times, Rosie always found reasons to make jokes and laugh. It's how she processed things. The next day, Rosie made another post about what she went through, this time revealing a little more information on why Bobby attacked her so badly. But she still wrote the message in her usual lighthearted way. I'm gone have to put my lil coochie in retirement. I mean, I knew it was a lil something between these legs, but I definitely never thought I would get beat up for not giving it to a mafucka enough, Chile. This mafucka is bad luck. Y'all dudes really out here beating up your wife because they don't sleep with you enough. Stomping them in the head with steel-toed boots on and trying to hit them in the face with tables and shit? No. Just Bobby... Oh. Okay. I pressed charges and put him out. No worries. She continued on to say, I'm really at this hospital at almost 2 a.m., where they have found bruises, lumps, and abrasions in places I didn't even think about. They want to x-ray crap. The whole right side of my face and head swollen. And I'm ashamed that I haven't shaved my legs in weeks. I'm tired as all hell. Now, while they were separated, Bobby moved out of the house and Rosie changed the locks. But a few days after he moved out, a family member of his came over to Rosie's house to get some of his things, and Rosie didn't like that. She thought it was strange that someone who had attacked his wife, in the way that Bobby attacked her, can still find solace and shelter with his family. To Rosie, that behavior was unacceptable, and if it was any family member of hers that attacked his wife, she would not have sheltered him. She took to Facebook to vent about people who do that not having any morals, saying, There isn't a male friend or family member of mine that would be able to hit his wife, GFBM or whoever and then seek shelter at my house. Flat out, I'm not housing no woman beater, not bringing him his shit from her house, not gonna do it. Some of y'all's morals are definitely questionable. How can you stay friends with someone who is a repeat offender? But through it all, Rosie continued to crack jokes online and make light of the situation. Some of her followers commented on how she didn't seem like she was going through something like that. And Rosie replied to them saying, she didn't act like a victim, 
because she didn't feel like one. I just want to thank you all for all the calls, texts, messages, comments, posts, virtual hugs, FB prayers, and even offers of money. Y'all the real MVPs. No matter the circumstances, I'm going to crack jokes lol. I'd be miserable if I couldn't laugh. If nothing else, I'm effing funny. And maybe I should act more like a victim. But I don't really feel like a victim. Like, I feel pretty friggin' victorious, actually. I'm here, black eye healing up nicely, and I'm still fine af. I've still got a place to live. My health, my wealth, my kids. Like, man, victim where? Freedom. Is that you, Playa? In fact, she was feeling so free and victorious that she decided to pack up the rest of Bobby's stuff and send them to him where he was staying. She went online to ask for help packing his stuff because she and her 13-year-old couldn't do it alone. So, what y'all doing on this good Saturday? Anyone want to come help me move his shit out of my house into a storage unit so he has no reason to come back here or continue contacting me? It's not a lot of stuff, but some speakers, TV, I'm giving him the bunk beds I purchased for his kids, etc. I mean, if me and my 13-wire-old have to do it all, we will. But help would be much appreciated. Let me know. I get off work at 12 p.m. Many people indicated interest in helping her move Bobby's stuff out of the house because they were very happy for her. They loved that she was now entering this new era where she was prioritizing herself and her joy and purging negative energy out of her life so they showed up to help her do it faster. But one person was noticeably unhappy about Rosie moving on. He particularly hated that she was sharing the details of his horrific behaviors online for everyone to see. The more she posted, the angrier he got, and eventually, he left a pretty threatening comment under one of her posts. Everyone enjoying the show, more to come, he wrote. It was clear what he meant by that post, and everyone who knew and loved Rosie became very worried about her and urged her to leave the house and go somewhere safe with the kids. But Rosie had already changed the locks and felt there was no way he would get in. She felt like she was the safest in her home. She was wrong. Had a lot of people that just loved her because she was such a sweet person. One of the friends that had been worried about Rosie was Stephanie St. John, a close friend of Rosie's, who was almost like an auntie to her. So she started to call her auntie while Stephanie called Rosie her niece. Stephanie St. John said her close friend Rosie McCullough called her auntie and as a nickname called Rosie her niece. According to Stephanie, until she took to Facebook to talk about what Bobby had done to her, she had kept the horrific details to herself for years and never confided in anyone. She says Rosie was private about the abuse she suffered till two weeks ago. He assaulted her, like, really badly. It was when it got to be too much that she decided to speak out about it. Not just for her benefit, but for other people in her situation who might be gathering the courage to leave. Rosie McCullough posted about her injuries after being released from the hospital. She said, he was able to stomp my chest and abdomen, so the bruising and swelling is really bad there. Her pain was so severe, she wrote that she received morphine through my IV. After Bobby left that threatening comment on Rosie's page, Stephanie became very worried about what Bobby could do to her if he found his way to her. Friends worried the next time would be even worse after Bobby McCullough posted this threat on Rosie's Facebook page. It said, Everyone, enjoy the show. More to come. Police were seeking to arrest Bobby McCullough for the domestic violence, but didn't believe he posed an imminent threat. She urged Rosie to get somewhere safe with the kids, but Rosie thought she was already somewhere safe. St. John says she encouraged her friend to take her kids and go stay somewhere safe. I said, uh, I need you to leave the house. I don't care where you go. I need you to get out of there. Unfortunately, Rosie refused to leave her home. What happened next was incredibly chilling. John said she last talked to Rosie around 6.30, but planned to check in regularly. And I'm calling, I'm calling. She didn't answer, and I sent her a text message. At first, Stephanie was relieved that she finally got a response from Rosie, but it didn't take her long to realize that the reply sounded nothing like Rosie. 
1030, St. John texted, answer me. The response was, busy, I will hit you back shortly. St. John wrote, girl, I was about to beat these streets. But then she realized that wasn't a normal response from Rosie. She wrote, Bobby, let my niece go. There was no response. Unfortunately, by then, it was too late. Bobby had already broken into the home. Tonight around 8.30, county officers called to the 4800 block of Lockwick Trail in North County after a neighbor reported a suspicious person in the area. After no signs of that person, police left. Bobby McCulley decided to go to Rosie's house, his intent to take her life. A neighbor saw him lurking around the house and called 911 to report him. But unfortunately, when the officers arrived at the scene, they didn't find anything suspicious, so they left. Not long after they left, another neighbor woke up to loud screams and yells, as if people were being tortured. She immediately knew it was coming from Rosie's house, so she tried to call her, but Rosie wasn't answering. Alarm bells quickly went off in her head. Too devastated to go on camera, her neighbor says she heard screaming and called 911, but it was too late. When I woke up, I heard like screaming and yelling and loud banging. Rosie, the lights flickered. Her porch lights flickered three times. That's when I called, I called her phone twice. She didn't answer. I knew something was wrong. So, a short time after the officers left, they were called back to the same address. They quickly surrounded the house and tried to peek in through the window to see if anyone was home because it was so quiet. What they saw sent chills down their spines. I called 911. They came, they looked around. They didn't see anything at first. They went to the back. When they went to the back, they came back running to the front with their guns drawn saying police. When they kicked the door down, they found Rosie laying on the ground near the front door. She was not moving, and it was very clear that she was no longer breathing. Even though Rosie's neighbor tried everything she could to get Rosie help, it was too late. That's when they kicked that door open, and her body was laying right there at the front door. By the time I heard everything and they got here, it was too late. It was too late for her and her kids. Only to get a call three hours later about Inside, 34-year-old Roseanne McCulley, 13-year-old Caden Johnson, 6-year-old Kaylee Brooks, all sh** death in the home. And a 1-year-old missing. An Amber Alert was issued immediately. Once officers discovered that Rosie's 1-year-old daughter was missing, they quickly issued an Amber Alert. It didn't take long for one of Bobby's family members to call the officers to let them know that Bobby had dropped her off with them before taking off. The child was found with a loved one around 3.30 in the morning in North St. Louis. All the evidence at the crime scene pointed at Bobby, and when investigators realized that he matched the description of the man that had been seen lurking about earlier that day, it was clear that they had their suspect. Police say it didn't take long for them to realize that 35-year-old Bobby McCauley III the victim's estranged husband is a suspect. They immediately launched a search for him, but he proved difficult to find. It also didn't help that they were derailed by some of Bobby's family who wanted to protect him despite what he had done. But despite their efforts, the investigators were able to find him. But just as they were closing in on him, he took his own life, choosing the coward's way out instead of answering for his crimes. The suspect found in the area as well in a car where he killed himself as officers tried to make the arrest. Over the course of the investigation, the investigators uncovered Bobby's dark past. Turns out, Rosie was not the first woman he had attacked. As far back as 2008, there were charges brought against him by the women in his life. One of the women he had dated told the court Bobby threatened her several times in front of her children. Another woman wrote to the court, detailing what she had suffered in his hands. But Bobby was only given a sentence of house arrest with an ankle monitor for a few months. Police say McCulley had a history of run-ins with the law dating back to 2008. More recently, the alleged suspect and victim had a domestic dispute in 2017, but no charges were pressed. Another thing investigators uncovered was that though Rosie was the one who initiated their separation, Bobby had been the one to file for divorce. And at the time he broke into Rosie's home to end her and her children's life, the authorities had been looking for him. Unfortunately, they didn't find him in time to save Rosie's life. The suspect had recently filed for divorce at the end of February, 
and police most recently were actively looking for him for a prior domestic incident. Sadly, they didn't find McCulley in time. This tragedy was not her fault by any stretch of the imagination. After Bobby ended his own life, the authorities couldn't charge him with his crimes, but they did charge his mother who had hindered their investigation. New charges this evening, 55-year-old Michelle Clayton now charged with hindering the investigation of a felony. According to investigators, Bobby's mom had lied to them about Bobby's whereabouts and sent them on a wild goose chase, which allowed Bobby enough time to escape. So police are still investigating this incident, but it, overall it seems to be wrapped up. And just from a big picture point of view, this further highlights rising cases of domestic violence in the past year, especially during the pandemic. Rosie McCulley's family were devastated by the loss of not just Rosie, but her beautiful children, who hadn't even gotten the chance to live their lives. A family grieves over a North St. Louis County mother and her two children killed in their own home. Her family gathered together to honor her and her two children, sharing stories of their interactions with Rosie. On Saturday in Clayton, people met to honor her and her two children. On Saturday, in front of the Buzz Westfall Justice Center in Clayton, people gathered to mourn the lives they say were taken too soon. Her mother spoke to the press at the event, saying she never thought she would lose her daughter and her grandchildren all in one day. I lost my daughter and my two grandchildren um, to something that I, I never imagined would happen. Rosie's mother, who now has custody of her one-year-old daughter, vowed to do everything she can to keep Rosie's memory alive for the sake of her daughter. Heartbreaking because she's only one and uh, she's not going to remember a lot, but I'm going to make sure that she's steeped in the uh, family. Rosie's mom also spoke about law enforcement's handling of Rosie's case. She felt that they did not take it seriously enough. They knew there had been multiple 911 calls made from the home in a short period of time. According to police records, multiple calls from the McCauley home were made in the last couple of weeks, one of them for domestic violence. And then when he violently attacked her, they saw what he did. Yet, they still didn't take the case seriously enough, classifying it instead as a misdemeanor. They saw exactly what had been done to her, and they charged it as some uh, misdemeanor, assault three or something, which meant they could only put out a wanted. That classification meant they didn't have to actively look for him, and they could just be relaxed about the case. Which means that they weren't actively looking for him. I mean, had he run across them at a traffic stop or something, they might have arrested him. But they didn't actively go out and find him. After Rosie's mom criticized law enforcement, they spoke about their approach on the case. And according to them, despite his history and all he did to Rosie, they still didn't think Bobby posed any real threat. They were wrong, and it cost Rosie her life. Police were seeking to arrest Bobby McCullough for the domestic violence, but didn't believe he posed an imminent threat. We had been looking for the suspect. She she was gonna she stayed there at the residence with her with her kids. Um, there wasn't any indications to us that he was gonna go back last night. We're right outside of Keevan Elementary where six-year-old Kaylee was a student. And as you can imagine, students and staff are devastated following the tragedy. And the victim's neighbors say that prior to this deadly shooting, the couple had a violent relationship. A few of Rosie's friends and neighbors also spoke to the press about the tragic events. They were shocked and heartbroken after a mother of three and two of her children were murdered inside their home in the 4800 block of Lock Trail. One of her neighbors who didn't want to be identified said Bobby and Rosie had a very violent relationship and Bob a lot. Are devastated following the tragedy and the victim's neighbors say that prior to this deadly shooting, the couple had a violent relationship. She described Rosie and her kids as beautiful souls, saying it was a tragedy that they were now all gone. It's a tragedy. Rosie was a beautiful, beautiful soul. Those kids, beautiful. And she did not deserve this, not one bit. You take innocent lives, you taking kids, kids that haven't even had a chance to live their life yet. Students who attended the same school as Rosie's children were also hugely affected by the tragic event. So much so that the school district offered free counseling sessions for anyone who might need it, staff and students alike. The mother of three was a graduate of Ledoux Horkin Watkins High School, and the kids, both students in the Hazelwood School District. The district released this statement. 
This is a heartbreaking loss for our entire school district. Our sincere thoughts and sympathies are with the family and friends of the victims. The district's team of counselors is working with each school community to make sure anyone struggling with grief receives the support they need. 13 year old Caden was also a student in the district. We're told that students are still 100% virtual, but grief counselors are assisting students and staff with emotional support. Rosie's friends also spoke out about Bobby's treatment of Rosie over the course of their relationship, with one of them calling him a sick, sadistic individual. This is a sick, sadistic individual. Who took the life of her dear friend. St. Louis is going to miss an extraordinary woman. Some of Rosie's loved ones had regret that they couldn't do more to save her, especially her friend Stephanie, who had an inkling that something was desperately wrong and wanted to go over to her house to make sure everything was all right. But instead, she got talked out of going over, a decision she said she'll regret for the rest of her life. St. John said she started to go to Rosie's house last night, but was talked out of it and now regrets. Rosie's passing was very tragic and swept through St. Louis like a wildfire. She had a reputation for being sweet and kind, so everyone who knew her was absolutely heartbroken by her death. But if it's possible for any good thing to come out of such tragedy, it would be the awareness her passing created on DV. I think it's pretty apparent when I say this, this case had absolutely no winners. It's heartbreaking the way it ended. And now county leaders are calling on you to protect family, friends, and loved one from future dangerous situations. The case led the county to raise awareness on DV and how families of people in such violent situations can help their loved ones. This is a call to action for everyone. A sad but necessary wake-up call for people to protect loved ones in violent situations. I think it also takes a village to protect a child and protect family members. They urged the people to get their family members in that situation help by pointing them to appropriate resources that might save their lives. We need people to point people, point their family members or their friends to the types of resources to get them help. And in the event that the situation had already progressed to violence, like in Rosie's case, the family and friends were urged to reach out to law enforcement if the victims themselves are unwilling to report it. Or if it's already crossed that line of violence, Sometimes you gotta do the uncomfortable thing, which is report it to law enforcement because, you know, maybe you, it might strain that relationship, but it might save someone's life. Even though they might risk their relationship with the victim, it's better to have them alive and not talking to you than to have them dead and have to live with the regret of not doing more. So sad, All Solutions President and CEO, Michelle Sherrod says events like Saturdays are necessary to end domestic violence. Hey, thank you for watching. Our deepest sympathies go to the family and friends of Rosie McCulley. May they find the strength to process their grief as well as move on from it. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in the comment section. And before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time and stay safe.